What's up guys, Ryan Sprague here, and I'm just dropping in to remind you about our Patreon campaign. Somewhere in the Skies is always free to consume, but it's not free to create. So if you want to help the show on a monthly basis, we have tons of rewards for you in return, including shoutouts on the show and website, bonus content and episodes, and free merch. Want to be my guest or pick a topic for the show? You can do that too. So if you'd like to learn more and to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you and keep looking up. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. The last few years have brought us some of the most well-documented UFO incidents to ever be released officially by the United States government and military. We learned of the now famous Navy UFO videos and accompanying incidents that occurred off the east and west coasts. We even learned of a dramatic chase of a UFO over the coast of Catalina Island, which has been coined the Nimitz Encounter. One of those witnesses was Lieutenant Commander Alex Dietrich. She remained anonymous since the story broke, but has since gone public to back up her fellow co-top gun pilot, Commander David Fravor, on what they experienced on November 14th, 2004, over the Pacific Ocean. So in November of 2004, off the coast of Southern California, we were preparing for our deployment, running training exercises, and when we launched, anticipating going to a particular airspace and, and running these uh, training exercises, we were interrupted uh, for a real world uh, intercept. We were vectored to try to t get a visual tally on something that another ship in our carrier strike group was picking up on their radar. Uh, so we followed their vectors and we ended up getting a visual contact. There were four air crew and two aircraft. So each aircraft is a cockpit with a pilot and a weapon systems officer. Uh, and so among the four of us, we picked up this visual tally on this UAP, this unidentified aerial phenomenon. The incident over the water was mysterious enough, but it didn't end there. According to Commander Fravor, something else was going on in the water as well. What drew us to it is there was, it was a perfectly calm blue ocean day, no white caps, and there was white water. The white water was kind of in the shape of, you can call it a cross, but about the size of a 737. So take a 737, drop it, and you'll look at it from the top and point it to the east, and we're down to the south of it. Um, that's what the white water looked like. And the Tic Tac was moving around that white water. So we didn't see if there was something below the surface. Because, you know, if it's 10, 15 feet below the surface, it's still going to cause the waves, those swells, to break over the top of it like a seamount. So we didn't, we didn't see anything below. We just know there was something causing that water to break over the top of it on a perfectly like a pristine, spectacular San Diego day is what it was. When we turned around, we couldn't find the disturbance in the water anymore, it was gone. So, you know, normally if it's a real seamount, it's gonna be there until, you know, God removes it. With an unprecedented amount of access to the witnesses to this event and many others encountered by the U.S. Navy, we've only scratched the surface of what's going on over our skies and in our oceans. When looking at the extensive data compiled by different UFO research organizations throughout the years, a staggering amount of these cases have occurred above or even in the world's oceans, lakes, and seas. Reports have dated far back beyond the modern UFO era, to include even the likes of Christopher Columbus, who, in his personal journals, while sailing to the New World, experienced a rash of strange lights emerging from the water darting into the air and following his voyage. The most dramatic of these events found all three ships being swarmed by glowing orbs of light that almost seemed to be guiding them. Coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, Columbus and his crew would discover the new world only hours after this strange occurrence. 
Or we have the now famous Shag Harbor incident, where some sort of craft crashed into the murky depths of the small fishing village waters, investigated by many official bodies, but no object ever being recovered. Because of the amount of cases of what has been coined unidentified submerged objects, or USOs, it may come of no surprise that many crews of ships and, in particular, submarines have witnessed a great many of these incidents as well. One particular sighting occurred at the end of the 1980s and involved a United States nuclear submarine whose mission was to patrol the waters ahead of a NASA space shuttle launch. Not only did they witness a strange triangular craft, but many other similar objects were witnessed in the days before and after the incident across the United States. The account was documented in the book, Military Encounters with Extraterrestrials, The Real War of the Worlds, by Frank Joseph. And as we'll see, these kinds of sightings have been taking place for decades in seas and oceans around the world, with some suggestions that these craft might be responsible for some of the very real sub-aquatic disasters of the 20th century. And this, once more, points UFO researchers to the depths of the waters, as opposed to the reaches of outer space. According to the report, courtesy of a crew member of the U.S. Navy submarine, the USS Memphis, they were around 150 miles off the coast of Florida when they experienced an event that would shake the very foundations of their beliefs. The main witness would state that their mission was to protect the NASA space shuttle, they were sitting on the launch pad in Florida. They would patrol the waters off the coast of Florida, looking out for potential terrorist attacks or other attempts to sabotage the upcoming mission. It was late in the evening, heading into the morning on October 25, 1989. The USS Memphis was cruising at a depth of around 500 feet. The mission had been standard until the submarine suddenly started to experience problems with their electronics. In fact, more than just problems, the witness would claim that the ship was malfunctioning altogether, and that the tanks were blowing, and navigation abilities and communications had become totally lost. A decision was made to bring the submarine to a stop, so that they could attempt to get a handle on just what was happening. However, when the controls in the reactor began to malfunction, the captain ordered it shut down and for the crew to surface immediately, switching to diesel engines when they did so. When the USS Memphis broke to the surface of the water, the witness went immediately to his watch station. When he looked out at the night sky, it was glowing red, like a neon sign. Moments later, he watched as a large inverted V-shaped object appeared on the port side of the submarine. Along with his superior officer and the captain, they used a laser range finder to estimate that they were about 650 feet from the nearest point of this strange V-shaped craft, with the furthest point being a little over 3,000 feet away. This suggested to them that the object was around half a mile across they could see that it was circling around the submarine. As it passed overhead, the electronics began to malfunction and go haywire. The red glow was clearly coming from the underside of this craft, lighting up the water below, which appeared to rise almost a foot as the object passed over it. The object then came to a sudden stop, hanging motionless for several seconds, causing the entire sky to shine a bright red. Then, without warning, it moved off at tremendous speed and disappeared. At the same time, the electronics returned to working order, except the communications and sonar, which appeared to be permanently damaged. After the captain ordered a systems check, they returned to the reactor power and set out back on their patrol. After they were moving through the water once more, the captain told the witness and the executive officer to join him in the wardroom. Ultimately, the captain would tell them that they should not speak about this until he had a chance to report it to the commander submarine fleet. Strangely, when they reached port around seven hours later, 
The witnesses were taken into protective custody. It was around three hours later when an officer from the Air Force arrived to speak with the men. Unbelievably to all three of them, they were informed by this officer that they had witnessed a quote, exploding weather satellite. Perhaps even more suspicious, certainly according to the witness, was that every single person on the crew of the USS Memphis at the time of the incident, after having served around four years together, were suddenly transferred to completely new assignments, without any explanation. Even the captain was transferred from the mission. The main witness remained quiet about the incident for several years, eventually reporting it to researchers when he had retired from active duty. According to researcher and writer Frank Joseph, the official record history of the USS Memphis states only that the submarine was underway for a dependence cruise in October 1989. All other references to that cruise, including the events of the 24th and 25th, had been deleted. Going back in time just a bit, during a patrol mission of the Second World War in March of 1944, the crew of a German submarine, the U-629, encountered an apparent otherworldly object while in the Bay of Biscay in the North Atlantic. The vessel had just surfaced when the radar operator noticed something approaching their location through the air at incredible pace. The first crew member to see this reported the object to Lieutenant Hans Helmuth Bux, who was in the conning tower. He was about to raise the alarm and get his crew to their stations when the object was suddenly directly over them. As the crew looked on, they could see a disc-shaped craft with white, yellow, and red blinking lights. They weren't certain if the lights were some kind of coded message, or simply incidental. The craft, though, remained overhead, showing no obvious signs of aggression. They contemplated responding with their own lights, but Bugs declined to do so. The object was around 40 feet above, and remained so for about 5 minutes. After this, it suddenly disappeared into the distance. Although they weren't certain, Bugs and his crew assumed the object was some kind of secret allied aircraft, possibly used to locate their position. Incidentally, the U-629 was sunk on June 7, 1944, in the English Channel as they attempted to launch an attack on allied ships. All on board lost their lives. Another incident occurred on November 12, 1972, when a Norwegian patrol boat off the coast of Bergen in Sonefjord noticed what they thought was a Russian submarine on their sonar scope. They immediately notified the Norwegian Navy, who responded by sending several vessels, including battleships, aircraft carriers, and submarines. Part of the response was to launch several Sea King helicopters, which would drop depth charges in the region of the ocean where the signals had been picked up. However, as they did so, they each began to experience problems with their instruments and other electronic equipment. They would return to their ship, essentially crippled and unable to fully operate. In their place, several fighter jets were launched to patrol the area from the skies. However, they experienced almost identical issues. Realizing that the quote, Russian submarine was no longer in the area, a blockade of sorts was set up in order to prevent whatever the underwater vehicle was from escaping into the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean. This blockade remained while intricate underwater searches took place, all of which proved to be unfruitful. Then, two weeks later, things changed. On the morning of November 26th, the object was picked up again, and what's more, it appeared as though it was attempting to sneak out of the mouth of Sonicfort and into the Atlantic Ocean. The Norwegian Navy moved quickly, dropping depth charges in the area where the object had been picked up. A short time later, the vehicle surfaced. However, it didn't take long for those at the scene to realize that the object was not a Russian submarine. Instead, what they witnessed 
was a large, cigar-shaped craft, completely different from anything any of the crew had ever seen before. One of the ships would even open fire on the object, followed by torpedoes launched from the submarine beneath the water. However, the barrage of firepower appeared to inflict no damage at all to the strange object. It remained on the surface for several moments, as if surveying the scene, before it disappeared under the water. As soon as it was out of sight, it vanished from all radar and sonar screens. The Norwegian Navy would ultimately track the strange object yet again on the surface of the water. They immediately launched an attack, once more coming from destroyers, submarines, and from the air. However, the craft simply continued on its way, unscathed and apparently unconcerned by the barrage of military fire. It would eventually submerge and disappear from sonar yet again. This would be the last time the Norwegian Navy would encounter the object, but it wasn't the last time they'd investigate it. Shortly after the incidents, they would send deep-sea divers down to spot where they believed they had identified something strange on the seabed near to where the original incident took place. The divers would observe strange tracks on the seabed, as if a underwater tank had made its way through the area. One of the divers would state that whatever had made the tracks was, quote, completely foreign to our technological capabilities, end quote. Several events occurred in 1968 that, while not directly involving UFOs on the surface, there were mysteries about these events that could leave one wondering. The first involved the Israeli submarine Dakar. On January 9th, the Dakar left Portsmouth in England. The captain of the Dakar was Major Yaakov Ra'anan and it was his job to oversee the performance of the newly acquired submarine. By January 23rd, the Dakar entered the Aegean Sea several days earlier than expected. They reported their arrival to the naval headquarters in Tel Aviv, and then fell strangely silent. The next time there was any kind of communication from the Dakar was on January 27th, when an apparent distress call was detected on the frequency of its emergency buoy. It was received by a radio station in Nicosia of Cyprus. A search of the area, somewhere to the southeast of Cyprus, went on for several days before being abandoned. According to Israeli officials, the Dakar was involved in crash diving tests, and it sunk as a result of mechanical failure. According to the report, the Dakar dove past her maximum depth, which likely caused a rupture to the hull. As the hull collapsed, the emergency buoy was released. Three decades later, the crippled vessel was discovered on the seabed between Crete and Cyprus. The vessel was on her side, with the conning tower essentially snapped off. The stern had also come away and laid a short distance from the main hull. It has been theorized that the Dakar went down on either the 24th or 25th of January, shortly after its last transmission to Tel Aviv headquarters. At around the same time on the morning of the 25th, just before 8 a.m., the French submarine, Minerve, notified its air escort that they were due to dock in Toulon at around 9 a.m. that morning. They would never arrive. Somewhere approximately 25 nautical miles off the French coast, the vessel seemingly vanished into thin air. Even stranger, there was no sign of anything unusual reported by the air escort. Several searches were carried out over the years. However, even up until today, no wreckage or signs of a final resting place for the Minerve has ever been found. Furthermore, there is no definitive explanation as to what happened that day off the south coast of France. There have been several theories put forward, such as a collision or structural damage, but a collision with what remains a mystery. In short, the disappearance of the submarine 
at around the same time as the loss of another submarine truly poses many questions. Once again, UFO researcher Frank Joseph would highlight several sightings of strange objects witnessed in the skies in proximity to the location and times of both the Dakar and Minerve incidents. Following a radioing of position from the United States submarine, the USS Scorpion, on May 22, 1968, all contact was lost and the submarine seemingly disappeared. On board was a crew of 99. Although the crippled submarine was eventually located, there was no clues as to what might have caused the sinking. Given that Commander Francis Slattery had signed off his last message by stating he was going to, quote, begin surveillance of the Soviets, end quote, it was at first suspected that the submarine had come under attack from the Russian Navy. However, the fact that they were too far away and that there was no evidence of an explosion amid the wreckage, external or internal, this had to be ruled out. Ultimately, the U.S. Navy's inquiry into the incident stated that what caused the USS Scorpion to sink, quote, cannot be ascertained from the evidence now available, end quote. Once more, Frank Joseph points to another UFO sighting that coincided with the loss of the USS Scorpion over Sherman Oaks, California. At around 11 a.m. on the day in question, two local residents witnessed a disc-shaped craft moving across the sky. However, on this occasion, there was yet another sighting that only came to light in the early 21st century. According to an incident reported to the National UFO Reporting Center in March of 2002, a witness on board the Hyades vessel experienced a bizarre incident shortly after the loss of the USS Scorpion. In fact, according to the report, the ship had been sent to the region in an attempt to locate the Scorpion. According to a witness, the last known location of the Scorpion was just off the Azor Islands in the Atlantic Ocean. As they were nearby, they got the call to head to the region. They would search the area for three full days and nights. However, on the second night, something strange happened. As they were moving their searchlights over the waters, an object reflected in the searchlight. The ship immediately turned towards the object, however, it was unable to locate it again. In later years, the witness learned that some had actually seen this strange object, and it had mysteriously lifted off the water and disappeared into the skies. And this lifting into the skies is what brings us to another fascinating account by a former Navy serviceman who went public for the very first time at the National Press Club in 2001 during the Disclosure Project event in Washington, D.C. My name is Dan Willis. I was in the United States Navy. I held a top secret crypto level 14 extra sensitive material handling security clearance. I worked in the code room at the Naval Communications Station in San Francisco. In 1969, I received a priority message from a ship near Alaska that uh, was classified as secret. The ship reported uh, merging out of the ocean uh, near Port Bow, a brightly glowing uh, reddish-orange elliptical object approximately 70 feet in diameter, merged out of the water, shot into space, uh, traveling at about 7,000 miles per hour. This was uh, tracked on ship's radar and substantiated. Years later, I worked at the um, Naval Electronic Engineering Center in San Diego for 13 years. The um, co-worker who I worked with worked at the NORAD facility. When he first started working at the facility, he noticed objects going on the screens to track everything out in space and in the air objects going off the scale, doing right-angle turns. When he inquired, um, his older supervisor advised him that, uh, quote, it was just a visit from one of our little friends. He thought this was a little unusual. Uh, these statements are true. I'm willing to testify under oath before Congress. Thank you.
What's up guys, Ryan dropping in to wish you all a very happy Halloween season. And what better way to celebrate than with Jim Harold's Campfire Podcast. With over 500 episodes of Campfire, you'll hear stories that will bend your reality and leave you truly spooked. The concept is pretty simple. Jim talks to regular folks about strange stuff that happens to them. And yes, that includes UFOs and UAPs, along with cryptids and, of course, ghosts. Now, not all the stories are horrifying. Some are pretty heartwarming, like a visit from a past loved one or a peaceful near-death experience. Regardless, they are true and fascinating stories, as told by ordinary people who've had extraordinary experiences. So, pull up a log and tune in to Jim Harold's Campfire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Somewhere in the Skies. And remember, stay spooky. This brings us to another very interesting military USO encounter, which had been previously hushed up by the Royal Air Force, but was revealed in documents made available to the public. According to the documents, in July of 1977, Flight Lieutenant A.M. Wood, who was based at RAF Bullmore in Northumberland, stated that he could see, quote, bright objects hanging over the North Sea, end quote. Wood estimated that the objects were around three miles off the coast of Northeast England and at an approximate height of 5,000 feet. He further described them as being, quote, luminous, round, and four to five times larger than a whirlwind helicopter." End quote. Wood's report was apparently corroborated by two officers who were stationed at a picket post on the base. They claimed they to observe the strange objects and watch them for over 90 minutes. Furthermore, the objects were also detected on the base's radar systems. Wood was described in the reports as a, quote, reliable and sober witness. The incident was kept from the larger population until the Freedom of Information Act forced the release into the public domain. Fourteen years prior to the North Sea incident, a short distance away in the North Atlantic, was another strange sighting. According to author Walter N. Webb, a lieutenant who served in the British Royal Navy witnessed a UFO that appeared out of nowhere above their fleet before it plunged into the depths of the North Atlantic Ocean. The incident allegedly happened in 1963 off the coast of Norway. The story was told to Webb two decades later in 1984 by a former lieutenant who went by the pseudonym Tom Preston. Preston was only 20 years old at the time, but was an experienced radar sonar operator and navigator. He stated that he was part of a Royal Navy fleet on exercises when, out of nowhere, a large object descended on them. Judging by how suddenly it appeared on the radar screen, it must have been moving at great speeds, before stopping almost instantly, according to Preston. Other ships in the area were contacted, and they too confirmed the object to be on their screens. So a radar malfunction was ruled out. The object appeared to be monitoring the small fleet for several moments before plunging under the surface of the water. During this, jets that had been scrambled to the fleet's assistance approached. The ship's sonar detectors also picked up on the now submerged object. The object, however, was moving at such speed that they soon lost the craft. Preston stated that later that day, he was summoned to speak with a senior officer on board the ship where he was reminded that he had signed the Official Secrets Act and was not to talk about what he'd seen. Preston also noticed that when he returned to duty, a new logbook had replaced the one they'd been using before, which was, incidentally, nowhere to be found. In a report alleged to have been obtained from declassified CIA files on Soviet UFO sightings, There came a report from a Russian merchant sailor who claimed to have spotted a strange craft hovering over the Mediterranean Sea in June of 1984. The seaman, Alexander Globa, was aboard the Soviet tanker Gori 
when at 4 p.m. one evening, he witnessed a strange object that he later said reminded him of an upside-down frying pan. While what he perceived to be the top of the craft was flat, the underside had a round shape to it, and the whole craft had a bright metallic shine. Upon closer inspection of the craft, Globus stated that the bottom section appeared to consist of two separate circles that were rotating in opposite directions to each other. Globa attempted to get the craft's attention by using a signal projector, but the object seemed to suddenly move upwards as if it were riding a wave that couldn't be seen before it eventually ascended quickly into the sky. Globa followed the craft as it made its way through the clouds, stating that it suddenly, quote, flared up and was then gone in an instant. A former Russian Navy officer turned respected UFO researcher, Vladimir Azaza, would claim that over 50% of the reports in Russia of USOs and UFOs were connected with the oceans, with many other sightings involving the Great Lakes in the region as well. Another harrowing event in the files stated that in 1951, a Soviet submarine encountered a massive underwater object, which measured over 250 meters long and was allegedly rising from the depths as it headed towards the shore. According to the report, the captain actually ordered depth charges to be dropped on the object, which seemed to have no effect, but which nevertheless caused it to stop its ascent change course and head out to deeper waters, where it eventually disappeared. Another more recent report in the files stated that in the spring of 2008, a Russian nuclear submarine on a mission in the Pacific Ocean suddenly picked up six unidentified objects on radar. They initially attempted to lose the objects by changing their course. However, when the objects continued to follow them, the captain made the decision to surface. Unbelievably, the six objects rose to the surface also, breaking from the water and shooting off into the air. It wasn't until these stories out of Russia came to light that someone else in the United States would come forward with an interesting story to tell about what was referred to as a fast mover. Mark D'Antonio has a degree in astronomy and has worked as the Mutual UFO Network's Chief Photo and Video Analyst. He's also the CEO of FX Models, a model-making and special effects company specializing in digital physical models. He's done extensive work in the film and television arena, including contracts with the U.S. Navy. One of those contracts would lead to him being invited aboard a Navy submarine during an exercise. It would be an experience that D'Antonio would never forget. You know, it was decades ago when I was allowed to go on a nuclear submarine and visit with the crew and go to sea. This event was wonderful, and I've always said it's the most fun I've ever had being seasick. <laughs> well, this trip turned out to be rather eventful rather than uneventful. It turned out that once at sea, um, I actually became seasick, and it was usually the case that when the sub's on the surface, it rocks and rolls like you can't believe. After all, it's effectively like a, a large pipe with end caps on it, right? So it rocks and rolls, and so I became seasick, uh, and during that time, uh, I visited the individual who passed as the doctor on the boat, and uh, he was a kid. Uh, way younger than me, and uh, he gave me some medication. Actually, it was a patch that he gave me to put on. When I was trying to overcome my seasickness, I went over and sat in the sonar shack, it's called. Now, you have the, the folks that steer the boat. You've got the two gentlemen that drive the boat. You have the first officer, the ex executive officer, the captain, um, and they're in the main control room of the boat. And off to the side, if you're looking forward from the stern, off to the right side, uh, on the other side of what's called the chart table, there's a row of screens, and those are the sonar screens, and they, they line the uh, starboard side of the boat, which is the right as seen from the back looking forward. 
And so I uh, sat down in one of the empty seats after asking the kid running the sonar if I could sit there. He says, yes, sir, you may sit there. I okay. And I didn't talk to him because he was busy looking at the sonar, tracking things. Now, it's true that once you submerge the boat, the boat feels like you feel right now, sitting in your room or, or place of residence. You don't feel much. You feel a vibrations. Uh, you feel vibration coming through your feet. All right, but you don't really feel any uh, anything else. You don't feel the rocking and rolling anymore, as long as you go deep enough. And the boat felt no rocking and rolling. Okay, we'll put it that way. So, uh, as we're going along, uh, the kid on the sonar, the tech is listening and, and looking at uh, the screen, which is called the waterfall uh, sonar. Uh, I couldn't read it. I mean, I, I did take some lessons on how to read it, but uh, very inept, and I, I wouldn't even think that I could read it, and I wouldn't try. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and I start to close my eyes because the patch is starting to do its work. You know, it was, it was some period of time since the patch uh, got put on. And as I'm as I'm sitting there, and starting to actually doze off. All you hear is the noise inside the boat, and it starts to become echoey in your head as you start to fall asleep, right? Um, and that's the thing about these submarines. They, they're they very loud inside. You hear high-pressure air, you know, whoosh, you hear people talking, blah, 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 okay? And it all blends into one white noise pattern in the background. Now, the pride of the Navy is that that sound never makes it out of the boat's hull. And that's the pride of the Navy. Okay, they've gotten that down to a science. Well, anyway, uh, as I sat there dozing off, all of a sudden, and it could have been some time after I dozed off, I don't know, uh, the tech on the sonar yells, Con sonar, con sonar, fast mover, fast mover. Uh, and I jolt awake. Uh, my seasickness is gone, probably uh, because of the adrenaline I was now feeling, because to me, a fast mover meant a torpedo. And I was immediately regretting my decision to go for this quote unquote ride on a submarine uh, when the fact was, uh, you know, I, I felt like I was going to die out here now. Well, the executive officer, known as the XO, comes around and he says, What do you have? And I'm sitting to the left of the kid at his station. He's, of course, to the right of me, and he's looking to the right of him at the executive officer who's looking down at him from a standing position. So the kid's looking up at him and, and telling him uh, things, and I was be, you know, behind the kid's head, basically, so I couldn't hear everything he said because of that noise I told you about. Uh, but he gave the executive officer the bearing and the range. It was a very short-term short, uh, trace, I guess, on the sonar. And then the executive officer said, well, how fast was it moving? And I heard him say that because the XO was facing me. And the kid actually answered him and said loudly in a way that I can't tell you how loud he was. He was very loud because he was incredulous. The kid actually had never seen anything like this before, you could tell. He held his hands out to his sides and he went, several hundred knots, sir. And the XO looks at the waterfall display, the sonar screen, looks at the kid and says, okay, he said, log it and dog it which meant to me bury it, uh, log it, and then hide it. And the kid just responded, Sir, yes, sir. Went back to his console and started getting on with his work. Now, look, I'm a guest on this boat, right? I was invited to go for this this this, uh, this excursion. And so you might... You'd be, I, I figured I would be forgiven for thinking I actually had some kind of special merit being on the boat. So I got up, Mr. Big Shot, that I thought I was, and I went over to the XO. I said, XO, um... I'm I'm somewhat familiar with these fast movers. Is there anything I can help you with? He looks at me and he goes, D'Antonio, is that correct? I go, yes, sir. He says, you having a good trip so far? I go, yes, sir. And he looks me right in the eye and says, let's keep it that way. And he turns and walks away. Okay, well, that put me in my place. So I basically felt, eh, that's just not good. So I went and sat down thinking about this fast mover that we we well they witnessed that I basically was party to and um, thought this is real stuff this is real so I got off the boat the XO nodded and shook my hand and said you have a good day now you know I said I will trust me I will and uh, 
that was that. A few years later, I had to do a job for the Joint Chiefs down in Washington. And I had an occasion to talk to one of the chiefs. And I asked him, what can you tell me about the Fast Mover program, chief? And he looked at me and he could have said, I have no idea what that is. Or, I don't know, you tell me. Or anything else. But instead, because apparently we work together, he looked at me and he says, I'm sorry, Mark, I can't talk about that program. I think he probably heard me just stun silence he you could hear my stun silence and from that point forward i've known that usos exist the stories of the fast movers didn't end there many others would continue to bubble to the surface during a 2019 podcast interview with joe rogan former united states navy commander david fravor who had chased the Tic Tac UFO, was told several stories about several dramatic fast mover incidents witnessed by a former helicopter pilot. He said he was flying CH-53s, which is a big lift, heavy lift that the Marine Corps uses, and the Navy uses it for certain things. Mm -hmm. And when they go off of, for the East Coast, they do a lot of shooting off of, at the time, it was off of Puerto Rico. We had Roosevelt Roads that they ended up closing. But he was flying out of there. And, you know, you got super clear Caribbean water, and they have these things that are called BQMs. They fly around, and then when they're all done, because they'll fly towards the ship, they can track with the radar. And then they also do, when the, like the ships or submarines shoot torpedoes, they're, they're called telemetry rounds. So they, have, they gather all the data on what the torpedo is doing underwater. And then they blow ballast, and this thing will come to the surface and float, and then they go pick them up, and then they can extract all the data out of them. So they do it for both. So he said the first time they're out, and they're going to pick up this BQM. And those things, when they're flying, they're done. A parachute comes out, and they got to go. They hook it up. The helo drops the swimmer in the water. He goes and hooks this whole thing up, and then they hoist the whole thing up and fly back, and then they extract the data. So he says he's sitting in the front. You know, in helicopters, there's, you know, CH-53, you can actually see down by your feet, you know, just like typical, like you go to Hawaii and ride because so, you can see when you're touching down. So you got really good visibility out of those things, and you can stick your head out the window, too, because you're just kind of hanging out. He says he's going on there, and they're getting this thing hooked up, and as he's looking down, you know, because they're, I don't know what, 50 feet above the water, he sees kind of this dark mass coming up from the depths. And they start to hoist the, the diver up, and he's got, they've got the BQM, and as they hoist it up, he says, and he's looking at this thing going, what the hell is that? And then it just goes back down underwater. It just like, once they pull the kid and the, the BQM out of the water, this object descends back into the depths. So he thinks, well, that was pretty weird. So he goes out, he says, not too long later, you know, a few months later, he's out and he's picking up a torpedo. So he says they got the, they hooked the diver up on the winch and they're lowering him in. And as he's looking down, he sees this big, massive, he goes, it's not a submarine. He's seen submarines before. Once you see a submarine, you, you can't confuse it with something else. This big object, you know, kind of circularly says, is coming up from the depths. And he starts screaming to, through the intercom system to tell him to pull the diver up. And the diver's like a few feet from the water. So they reverse the winch, and the diver's thinking, what the hell's going on? And he's getting pulled up, and all of a sudden, uh, he said the torpedo just got sucked down underwater, and the object just descended back down into the depths, and they never recovered the, the torpedo. While many of these USO and fast mover stories are just that, stories, other cases in and around the water would come to light in 2021 by investigative filmmaker Jeremy Corbell and investigative reporter George Knapp. One case in particular included striking video of a spherical object about six feet in diameter that was following the USS Omaha for over an hour. The spherical object was caught on FLIR camera on July 15, 2019. This is the actual audio in real time as the event was happening from the command center. Break Omaha, pick me, kid, Rocco Pearl, to pass ability to launch Hilo ASAP. It's flashing your bearing ring. Got your wings three months. Keep going, bro. You're making chance we could probably bring that 35 relative to the end of the month. Sir. Yeah, I'm bringing it down. We got some of the white water up there, six foot swells. Whoa, it's getting close. Yeah, and we have a 31 knot sustained wind top side. What was splashed? Splashed. Mark bearing and range. Whatever this spherical object was, it apparently submerged into the water. Crew members from the Omaha attempted to find and retrieve the object, but were unsuccessful and found nothing. But this wasn't it. 
There were apparently over a dozen spherical objects swarming the ship over a span of three days. At one point, the ship was completely surrounded by them. Here is additional audio from the command center in terms of what they were experiencing on radar. Well, if you can write a general lat long where we're at, uh, and then uh, the number of contacts you got, if they force the speed leaders off them, you know what I mean, and wrote a position to us, like bearings, might be helpful too. Eyes up. Eyes down. Track, 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 track. Right, 781 just sped up to 46 knots, 50 knots, closing in. Oh, actually 38 knots, so fast. That, that one's pretty much perfectly 0 0 relative, right? Yeah. 263 in 3 miles, 55 knots. How? and why Jeremy Corbell came into possession of these videos has yet to be revealed. But they were authenticated and confirmed by the Pentagon spokesperson, Susan Goff. Whatever these objects were, there is still no explanation as to where they were coming from or where they were going to. And this leads us up to today. With hundreds of additional USO encounters from across the world, Having been reported throughout the decades, they are just as mysterious and prevalent as UFOs in our skies. And while it may appear that the world's militaries know little about these aquatic phenomena, the possibility that they know more than they have publicly revealed remains. From strange lights surrounding the ships of Christopher Columbus, to the UFO or USO swarms happening over US Navy vessels in modern day, so many questions remain. What are these strange phenomena over our waters? Are they a potential threat? Do they possess intelligence to monitor us? And once again, where are they coming from and going to? Like most UFO mysteries, there is likely no one answer to all of these cases. In fact, many could have prosaic explanations that have absolutely nothing to do with UFOs or USOs. But whatever those answers may be, they remain elusive, hidden in not so plain sight, in the depths of our waters, just as they always have in the vastness of our skies. A large portion of this episode was researched and written by Marcus Loth. It was originally published on the website ufoinsight.com under the title The USS Memphis Incident and the Persistent Underwater UFO Presence. Appropriate links to UFO Insight and the work of Marcus Loth can be found in the show notes. Our special thanks to UFO Insight for their collaboration on this episode. Special thanks also to Mark D'Antonio for sharing his story with us. You can follow him on Twitter, at FXModels. If you have a few moments, please consider rating and reviewing Somewhere in the Skies on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get the show. It helps us gain visibility and find new listeners. We're also on Twitter, at Somewhere Skies, and Instagram, at Somewhere Skies Pod. Thank you as always to the E1 Podcast Network, and especially to you for listening. And remember, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching somewhere in our waters. Thank you.